Okay, let's let me start by introducing today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Theodor Lundberg. He's a PhD student at the Hitachi Laboratory and he's working on silicon quantum dots. He's supervised by Henning Seringhaus and Fernando Gonzalez Zalba and Jason Robinson. And previously he's worked with Philip Kim at Harvard and Charles Marcus at the University of Copenhagen. Today, uh, Theodore is going to tell us about this exciting work um, on the spin blockade. So Theodore, thanks a lot for, for coming to give the seminar. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much for, uh, for the intro and, uh, and for having me. And thanks for uh, all the participants on joining in. Um, good. So um, let's see. There we go. You should see the screen now. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be giving a talk today about uh, silicon quantum dots and some work uh, that I've been doing in, in a very fruitful collaboration together with a with a with a bunch of very uh, clever people and nice people, both from here from Cambridge, but also from France, in with CLFC and CNRS um, in Grenoble. Um, and I, given that I think. Uh, we have some participants that are not experts on on spin qubits and on silicon quantum dots. I will be spending some some of the time at the start of the seminar giving some background uh, before diving into the experimental results. So um, the outline of the seminar will will be kind of having in two parts. So take a brief look at spin qubits in silicon and specifically on also how we do uh, qubit readout uh, for this type of qubits. Um, and then I'll briefly mention the relevance of, of high spin states uh, in general, not only in, in quantum information processing, but in general in physics uh, to kind of motivate our work, which I'll be talking about in the second part of the talk. Um, I'll just uh, add a pointer here. Um, in the second part of the talk, um, where well, I'll go through the experimental data and some quite neat results where we, uh, where we discover uh, a spin quintet in our silicon double quantum dot system. Good. So let's kick off with with taking a look at at how spin qubits can be kind of manufactured in silicon. So uh, there's generally two different uh, methods. Uh, so either you use a silicon MOS structure, where you can have a metal gate that is separated by an oxide from silicon, and by applying a potential to the gate, you can uh, accumulate electrons uh, or holes, uh, depending on, on the doping of, um, of the underlying layer. And then you can form quantum dots in that way. And the other way is, is, uh, is using a silicon-silicon germanium heterostructure. So these are basically the two common ways. There are other ways, but, um, but then with the silicon, uh, silicon germanium heterostructure, you get a 2D electron gas that you can then gate. And that's what you see here that in in both the MOS case and the, in the silicon germanium case, you can gate the silicon or the, the two deg to form quantum dots. Um, and if we look at the energy landscape for those quantum dots, um, we can have reservoirs, which in some cases, uh, uh, in, and in our specific case, could be a source or a drain reservoir where you have a bunch of electrons that you can pull in to your quantum dot. Uh, and then this quantum dot, just like an atom, will have uh, certain energy levels. And you can also expand this to add more gates uh, in order to define a double quantum dot, uh, which can then either have a tunable uh, um, energy separation between or energy barrier, or it can just be determined by the device geometry. Um, and here you see that this is essentially a little bit similar to a diatomic molecule. Um, with, with energy levels, and they can also have bonding and bonding states. Good. So when you then want to implement a spin qubit, you can do it, as I mentioned, both with electrons and holes. You can also do it with, for example, a, a nuclear spin. It could be, uh, for example, a phosphorus dopant in, in silicon. Then a slightly different way. You don't exactly define a quantum dot, but then you have an actual atom rather than a, than a quantum dot. And you're uh, basis states for your spin qubit can, for example, be spin up or spin down, but they can also be uh, combinations of spins. So for example, if you have two spins, uh, for example, in the case of the double quantum dot, you can have uh, the singlet and, and, and the triplet state, and they can be your, your basis states. Um, and in order to achieve uh, 
uh, control of your qubit. So, um, which is of course a requirement if you're building a quantum computer, the, the general ways of achieving control of your spin qubit uh, for, for um, one qubit rotations. So that's rotations around uh, the full block sphere is most commonly done either by electron spin resonance or electron dipole spin resonance um, shown respectively in these two cases where you have a uh, magnetic uh, or sorry, an ESR line, which is basically uh, uh, can deliver an oscillating magnetic field and then rotate the spin. Or you can have a micromagnet here that increases your um, basically the spin orbit coupling so you can do uh, electrical manipulation of your spin. And then two qubit gates are most commonly implemented using the exchange interaction between uh, uh, quantum dots. Good. Uh, so the current state of the field, just so you know roughly um, what the these qubits can do. Uh, T1, so this is the relaxation time, is can be on the order of milliseconds to, to seconds. And the uh, coherence time of these qubits uh, can be tens of microseconds um, and potentially even longer actually, which is, and this is one of the, the main selling points of spin qubits, the long coherence time. Um, and especially compared to how long uh, gate operations uh, take. Good. Then uh, uh, over the past years, it's been quite exciting. Actually, you can see all these references are within just the past two years. Lots of uh, um, nice results with getting quite high fidelity gates, uh, both uh, single qubit gates and two qubit gates. And we also was one paper that that implemented very basic Deutsch, Josa, and Grover such algorithms on a two qubit um, device. Good. So. Now looking a little bit more specifically on, on our work um, in the group, we were part of a, a consortium called the Mosqu Mosquito Consortium, um, where we collaborate with these institutions. And uh, the premise or concept is basically to use uh, MOS silicon devices for making a qubit. So it's devices uh, like these, where you have, it's, it's sort of like a, a nanowire field effect transistor, if you might be familiar with that, where you have a nanowire between a source and drain. Um, and then you have uh, a gate that overlaps. But the difference between the device we have here and a nanowire field effect transistor is that the gate that overlaps the nanowire is cut in two. You can also see that on the artistic representation here. So you actually end up having two gates that can control the potential of a quantum dot that then is defined in the corner of the nanowire and similarly on the other side. And the benefits of this sort of platform is that you have the CMOS fabrication platform, which uh, fabrication engineers have uh, decades of experience in, uh, uh, using. And we also have the potential uh, easy integrative um, integration with conventional electronics. Um, so there's a lot of work happening on um, uh, control electronics that can exist on the on the, at around four Kelvin and can help uh, uh, implement qubits. And simultaneously, there's also some work trying to bring up the, the temperature that spin qubits can operate at. So one of the um, results I showed on a previous slide was, was a relatively high uh, two qubit gate fidelity at 1.5 Kelvin. So if you can bridge those two temperatures together and get the control electronics and the qubit electronics to work at the same temperature, you could have quite nice integration. Um, and then lastly, uh, these sorts of devices have a very large overlap of the gate with the, with the wave function of, of the electrons, which creates a, it's what's called a strong uh, leave arm or alpha, which allows us to do quite sensitive readout. Um, and that brings me to talk about readout in this system. Um, all these uh, spin qubits are uh, generally read through spin to charge conversion. So it's quite hard to read spin by itself. So what we do instead is to use a mechanism where we can read the charge instead, for example. Uh, and that can be done um, with a charge sensor. And I think this is probably the most common way of achieving it. Um, so basically you can have a, uh, a device that is right next to your quantum dot. So the quantum dot is here. And then you can have a device that can sense the charge of the quantum dot. Um, this is a single electron transistor, which can very routinely achieve high sensitivity. The uh, kind of negative side of using this um, is 
is from a scalability perspective that you have many uh, leads and there's also this requirement of proximity so it becomes a bit harder to scale. Uh, then another uh, um, branch of readout is, is uh, more related to the superconducting qubit field, uh, circuit quantum electrodynamics, where you couple your double quantum dot. Um, and here you see all the gates. So the gates are controlled with these lines. And then you have a resonator that goes from left to right here uh, that can then allow you to couple the spin of the double quantum dot to a photon inside this microwave resonator. Um, and there have been some very nice results that achieve uh, strong coupling where the coupling between the spin and the photon is larger than the loss rate uh, of the resonator and of the qubit. So that basically means that you have a coherent uh, transfer of, inf of quantum information between the spin and the photon, which enables you actually to couple uh, to a, a distant uh, double quantum dot. Um, so this could be a way of, of scaling up as well. Um, this, if we again look at the kind of con uh, of this approach is uh, uh, that it requires a large on-chip footprint, which is what we also see in superconducting qubits, um, uh, where you have to rest, uh, integrate both the qubit and the resonator on the same chip. And then lastly, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, an approach that is quite similar to circuit quantum electrodynamics, uh, but where the resonator is removed from the chip. Uh, so basically you can imagine that uh, you, have, you might have a PCB that has uh, a resonator on one part of the PCB, PCB and then you bond it to um, your uh, chip that has your device. Um, so this simplifies your, uh, your chip design with your quantum devices uh, and then removes the complexity to another area. Um, and this is the approach that we use uh, in our group. So I'll be explaining that a little bit more in detail later on. Good. Um, so I mentioned spin to charge conversion um, early on as the typical way of, of reading spin. And uh, the way that has achieved the highest fidelity readout is, is what's called spin, Pauli spin blockade. And the principle behind that is, uh, is illustrated in the case where we have two electrons. And um, this works uh, both for the singlet triplet basis states as well as for, for the single, uh, single spin qubits, where in the single spin case, uh, one of these electrons is simply just an ancilla qubit that is used for readout. But in the, in the single triplet uh, case, um, you use both uh, uh, quantum dots as qubits. So suppose you want to read the state of uh, the, the left, sorry, the right dot, and we want to use the left dot to read the state. You can try to move the electron that's in the right dot over to the left dot. And we'll see that in the upper case, that's not a problem because uh, the Pauli exclusion principle doesn't uh, exclude um, two anti-parallel states, uh, uh, electrons in the same state. But if you have uh, parallel spins, of course, that violates the Pauli exclusion principle. So if you were to move uh, uh, this electron over to the left, you need to uh, add some energy so that you can access the, the nearest excited state. And we call this the singlet uh, triplet splitting, um, this energy difference. Um, so that's basically by, by monitoring whether you can, without adding energy, can move your right electron over to the left or not, that can help you determine whether you, the, the rightmost electron is spin up or spin down, or whether you, uh, your initial state was a singlet or a triplet state. So that's your readout mechanism. Good. So let's look a little bit more at, at some of the uh, physics that goes on um, in, a, in a double quantum dot. So we have these gates that can control the electrochemical uh, potential of each quantum dot. So by applying a larger voltage, we encourage more electrons uh, to form in the double quantum dot. And we can see here that if we have gate one and the potential of, of gate one, we can see that increasing the voltage on gate one adds an electron uh, to the first quantum dot. And we can see that every gray line indicates the addition of an electron. And very similarly for, for, um, for gate two. And the reason we have a slope here uh, and that they're not just completely vertical and horizontal lines is that um, here we assume that gate one has a cross coupling to uh, quantum dot two. Uh, 
Um, and then the reason we have red lines in between here is that you can actually also have an electron moving from the left dot to the right dot and vice versa. So not adding an electron from a reservoir, for example, from the source of drain, but where you move electrons, just redistribute them within the quantum dot, double quantum dot. And it's these uh, inter-dot charge transitions, which I uh, will call ICTs in the, in, in the following. It's these ICTs that present the, the interesting physics uh, where you would implement your qubit and where you would also uh, perform readout. And here I've sketched the energy diagram where you can see that in the 1-1 one, one, uh, case where you have uh, an ele electron in each dot, um, you can remember that from the previous slide, um, you see that they both have equal energies, the singlet and the triplet states, but as we move to the occupation where both electrons are in, in the same dot, we have that singlet triplet splitting here. And then you have, um, you see, you notice an anti-crossing between the states here, which is basically related to a, to a tunnel coupling, uh, uh, delta S, um, that creates this anti-crossing uh, between the states. Good. So how do we, using this uh, gate-based dispersive detection, how can we detect uh, whether we are in a singlet state or in a triplet state? Well, the way that the gate-based dispersive detection works is that you have that resonator that has a certain resonance frequency that is dependent on the device capacitance. And here we see that the capacitance uh, that's associated with the device is proportional to uh, the curvature of the uh, energy level um, uh, versus gate voltage. And gate voltage is basically equivalent to what we call the tuning here. So there's only a constant factor. I think that was on the previous slide. So here you see the, um, the conversion where epsilon is basically just equal to that alpha factor, which is just a constant times the electron charge. So basically, these two axes are the same. Um, so here we see, OK, well, where do we have curvature? We have curvature at zero to tuning for the singlet states but there's no curvature for the triplet states. So that means that there's a capacitive contribution only from the singlet states at zero to tuning and not from the triplets. So that results in us being able to detect that with the resonator. Um, so here we can see, for example, if we then increase uh, the magnetic field, the triplets uh, states which have a net spin will of course split according to the Seaman splitting. And now we see that at zero to tuning, the triplet state becomes the ground state. So we now no longer have a capacitive contribution. So the dispersive uh, uh, readout method will not generate a signal anymore. And this is something that's quite, uh, has been measured uh, before in, uh, in literature. So here we see at low magnetic field, we have the, the signal of the blue singlet state, the curvature of that. But as the magnetic field is increased, we see that the signal starts asymmetrically disappearing from the one one side. And that's of course, because you can see the red line going down. So it, it becomes the ground state first from the left. And that's why you see the asymmetric vanishing of the signal from the one one side as you increase the magnetic field. And then depending on how big your singlet tripling splitting is and where your uh, red triplet state starts to curve, um, you can actually see that at, in, in some devices where the, where the singlet triplet splitting is small, you can see that the ground state, the, tri the triplet can become a ground state and then you start seeing the curvature of the triplet state here. So basically what you see down here at low field is the is this curvature of the singlet state and then it disappears from the one one side. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see on, on this figure but it disappears from the one one side and then uh, a triplet signal starts resurfacing um, at, on, the, on the two zero side at higher field. So this is a kind of a take home message for, uh, for later in the talk. If uh, the dispersive signal of a low spin state disappears from the left or from the one one side, then you uh, expect and the, um, actually the, it, it must be so that the high spin state signal must appear on the right or on the two zero side and vice versa. Um, 
So that I'll get back to that later in the talk. Um, and then as the final part of the kind of background, uh, uh, I'd just like to mention the relevance of high spin states. Um, so high spin states, um, I'll classify as spin states that have a higher uh, spin angular momentum than a one. So for example, one and a, uh, one and a half or two um, are relevant in a, in a range of, of fields in physics. So for example, singlet fission, um, which is a, is a sl slightly perplexing mechanism that happens in, in organic photovoltaics where the intermediate state uh, in the signaling fission process is this um, quintet-like state that either has a triplet-triplet joint nature or, or a quintet nature, um, which is something that researchers are trying to understand. Um, then we also in, have molecules that have large delocalized electron systems. Um, those, the physical properties of those uh, also rely on high spin states. That could, for example, be relevant for uh, catalytic activity of, of these molecules. And then you also have uh, unconventional superconductivity where your uh, Cooper pairs don't only have just a net spin of one, um, but where you can have larger spin um, in, your, in your superconductivity. And then of course, for, for quantum information, it's also relevant to know. And this is what, I, what I'm briefly outlining on this slide is some of the research that has been done on, on high spin states in, in QIP. So this is, for example, um, in the first case, we have here a, a triple quantum dot in gallium arsenide. We either have, and then we have a three electron double quantum dot in gallium arsenide um, from UST in China. And in, in um, the only example where people have looked of in, at high spin states in silicon is uh, the high spin states associated with acceptor dopant atoms in silicon. And that's some work from UNS Dublin. You can see that the energy spectrum here gets quite complicated compared to the ones I've shown you so far, um, but also quite interesting. And the, the relevance from a QIP perspective is that you can you could use these uh, additional states as basis states. Um, I can't say whether that's uh, adv advantageous or not, but certainly it is very relevant to um, to identify the low spin states because they will most likely be your uh, the best state for your for your basis state. So that correct identification is very important. Good. So so this is uh, the background uh, you need to to know uh, what I'll be presenting about next, which is our experimental results. So here um, we have our device, uh, where in the corners we have the quantum dots. Um, I've already shown you the device, so I won't uh, on a previous slide, so I won't go much more into detail. But here you can see that we couple one of the gates to a resonator uh, that then exists el elsewhere on a on a circuit board um, with a custom made inductor um, that gives us a quite uh, quite good Q factor for the resonator, and then we can do this gate based uh, dispersive readout, which is also called reflectometry, where we basically send in. Uh, a drive signal at around 700 megahertz, and then we monitor how that's reflected uh, from the rest nature. And then basically the phase shift uh, that results from, from mixing the original signal with the reflected signal uh, can then be associated um, to, for example, the curvature of, of the singlet state. And then we also have uh, the other gate coupled uh, to a fast line so we can do some pulsing experiments. Um, which I'll get into at the very end of the talk. Good. So if you recall the, uh, the uh, stability diagram where we sweep the, the voltages of the two gates um, from, the kind of, from the introductory part of the seminar, here we basically have the equivalent, but now with experimental data. So you can see if we look here that as you increase um, the voltage, there are these kinks um, along the line. And these kinks all indicate the addition of an electron. And we can't see the vertical lines until a little bit later uh, um, because we don't have uh, as good a coupling to that dot. So you, you have the rest nature on one gate and then it's a little bit harder to see what's going on on the other gate. But when we have seven electrons, we can start to see that we also have the vertical lines. Um, so basically each kink allows us to identify when an electron is added, which is quite neat. So we can then 
uh, increase the voltages on our x and y axes. Um, and then that allows us to, uh, to see more transitions. And here, the uh, incident transitions, the ICTs, are quite strong signal compared to the, uh, to the vertical and horizontal lines, which is why it's a little bit hard to see here. But essentially, we can uh, count any electron occupancy here and then just zoom in on, for example, this guy, uh, which has an even number of electrons. So we expect that it behaves quite similar to the 1102 occupation. And then this is what we then uh, uh, study in, in the paper that we uh, recently published. Um, so to, in order to understand the spin physics, uh, the most common way of understanding the spin physics is by monitoring what happens as a function of magnetic field. So we take this line trace here, and then we monitor what happens as a function of magnetic field, a bit similar to what um, we saw in the introduction. So here we see at zero field, we see the sig signal from the singlet states. That's very clear. Um, and then as we increase the magnetic field, we see uh, the signal disappears. And that's because of that Pauli spin locate that I talked about before. Uh, but quite neatly here, we see the, the resurfacing of the signal again, and then it disappears again. So how do we interpret this? So I just wanted to remind you of, of the thing uh, I, uh, I recommended as a, as a thing to remember, uh, that if the signal disappears from the left, then we expect the next signal to come on the right, as we saw here on the two zero side. So let's look at our data. So as I said, at zero field, it's the curvature of the singlet state that we see. And then we can see as we incre increase the magnetic field that it disappears asymmetrically from the left here. Uh, so this is the one one side on the on the left. And that means that the triplet signal should be coming somewhere on the right. Um, and we have looked uh, beyond the, the range of this uh, uh, measurement too, but there's nothing that comes on the right. It comes on the left instead. So how do we explain that? So it's actually um, the triplet states do come in on the right, right here. But what happens is that um, they are very similar in energy to the singlet states. And then there's an additional uh, higher spin state. So, um, a quintet state that has uh, four unpaired electrons. And then as a result of the Seaman interaction being twice as, uh, sorry, the Seaman splitting being twice as strong for the quintets uh, than the triplets, you actually have, you can see that there's a slight uh, uh, tilt here or asymmetric vanishing from the right. So that's basically the quintet uh, becoming lower in energy than both the singlet and the triplet and hence spin blockading both those states. Um, and then eventually, then at high field, we see the quintet becoming the ground state. So here we see a quintet state and the curvature of that quintet state becoming a ground state, uh, which then itself also becomes block blockaded. Um, and that can then only be by a spin state that has a higher spin. So now we basically, uh, this uh, electron pair here is because of the very high magnetic field is uh, split. And now we end up with a six electron uh, septet state as the lowest energy state at five Tesla. Um, and just to, so the energy damp band diagram to the right here was all at zero Tesla. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like at 3.5 Tesla, you can see that here the green quintet states are now the lowest energy state. And that's why we see the signal and the quintet states are now sorry, the subset states are very low energy too. And as you increase the magnetic field further because of the, the difference in Seaman splitting, the uh, subset states will eventually become the lowest energy states. Um, so now that we've extracted this quite uh, complicated energy defined diagram as the explanation for our data, how do we kind of confirm that, that this is indeed uh, an accurate representation? Well. We developed a model that quite simply just looks at the capacitive contribution from the curvature of each of these states. So basically it factors in every single of curvature here and um, factors in what state is, is the lowest energy state at different magnetic fields. Um, and based on that simulation, 
we get a quite neat result that, uh, that matches our data quite well. Um, so even though we require a, a quite complicated energy band diagram to explain the data, we're very confident that this is the case. Um, uh, so now that uh, we have a good understanding of the energy level and that we do indeed have these quite interesting uh, uh, high spin states in this double quantum dot, we thought it would be neat to investigate the properties of this quintet state. Um, so that's why we turn to some, some dynamic uh, measurements where we do some pulsing uh, with that uh, other gate that I showed you in the setup. So here we set the magnetic field to the point of uh, quintet triplet blockade. So that's at five Tesla where um, I can just show you on the previous plot. So we are just below uh, where we see the signal of, of the quintet state, um, which means that the quintet state is an excited state, but it's quite close to being a ground state. And that's what you see here on this uh, energy band diagram here. So you see the quintet state uh, curvature is an excited state, which is why we see no signal. And our idea then is that we apply a pulse that uh, initializes on the right side here, where the quintet state is the lowest energy state. And then we pulse very quickly into the point um, of the tuning where we know that the quintet should have curvature. Um, and then we monitor, okay, well, how long can the st quintet state survive before it relaxes to the no signal triplet state. Um, so by monitoring and changing how long we sit here and wait before we go back and then repeat, um, we can see that if we go very fast, so we don't allow uh, hardly any time for the, for the electron to relax, we see that we generate a signal uh, where we before had no signal uh, if we didn't do any pulsing. But if we wait very long here, uh, you're basically just measuring the triplet state, um, which would be the same as if we didn't pulse, so we see no signal. And we can see that if we fit this line to an exponential fit, we can extract the relaxation time of that quintet state to the triplet state, which is around four microseconds. Um, and in a very similar approach, where we ramp up the magnetic field to 4.5 Tesla, which is the region where the uh, septet state has just started to block the quintet state. So we, here we see the septet state as the lowest energy state. If we then a pulse now from the other side, um, so we pulse in here, then we wait for, again, for, for a certain time t wait here. We can see again, uh, a very similar experiment and very similar results where we see the electron relaxing with a relaxation rate of around four microseconds. And I want to just to, to note the, the value here of four microseconds is significantly faster relaxation than the, the, the relaxation time scales I mentioned in the start of this seminar um, of around milliseconds to second scale. And this faster relaxation mechanism is something that uh, we both think can be a subject to further study, but um, we attribute it to, uh, to basically the a likely mixing between the uh, many states um, that we see in this dense energy spectrum. So it creates um, an additional mixing and that additional mixing um, of the states um, uh, allows for, for faster relaxation. Um, so this is an indication that it might not be an optimal state to use for, for quantum information processing, um, yet it is quite, still quite neat that we can, we can study these high spin states in this platform. So to summarize um, these results, uh, we were able to look at uh, the double quantum dot and dispersively uh, detect the addition of the first electron and then subsequently count any additional electron there and, and then zoom in on a certain electron occupancy. Uh, occupancy. Um, then we were able to identify using magnetospectroscopy and uh, successive uh, regions of Pauli spin blockade, we could find the existence of quintet and set of states, uh, which haven't been studied before in silicon. Um, and this is also uh, a, a, a showcase for, for the relevance of magnetospectroscopy in uh, accurately identifying uh, the spin states of your system uh, and also for understanding them. Um, and this double quantum dot allowed us to 
to measure the relaxation time of the quintet. And uh, as a kind of future perspective, it could be quite interesting maybe to further study the properties of high spin states um, and the interactions of high spin states in this system. Um, so that could be general, maybe more inter also interesting for other areas than for, for QIP. Good, so that brings uh, my talk to an end. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Hey, thanks a lot, Theodore, for this really, really nice, really nice talk. I, I think in particular, like your, your introduction was much clearer than any of the courses I took back in uni when we were, when we were reading about these things. So that was great to see. Um, just to reiterate to, to everyone who's listening in, uh, if you'd like to, to ask Theodore a question, just press the Q&A button below and then just say, hey, I want to ask a question and, and then Hugo will promote you to a panelist so you can join the, jo join the panel and ask your question live. Um, meanwhile, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question my, myself or it's, it's not really a question, but I thought there are quite a, a few students I see uh, attending this talk. So maybe you could say something about the benefits of using, and, and you did say a few, but what are the like main benefits of using silicon as, as your platform for quantum information processing compared to maybe gallium arsenide or, or other semiconductor platforms? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I think uh, with silicon compared to gallium arsenide, uh, the most obvious advantage is that there is a, the, you can, in silicon, you can create a, a um, an isotope free or the, your kind of bath of, or your substrate um, uh, doesn't have any uh, nuclear spin. So you can have pure silicon 28 as your substrate. And um, that means that your spin is not uh, constantly being uh, or interacting with these nuclear spins in your, um, in your substrate. And in gallium arsenide, you can't remove that. So that's why you see a very low uh, coherence rate for, for spins in gallium arsenide, whereas for silicon, if you isotopically purify your substrate, um, which is which is quite standard to do, like uh, uh, it, yeah, so making making or having silicon 28 wafers is, is very doable. You can have these very long uh, coherence times, which is also compared to superconducting qubits, advantageous that you have uh, more time to perform your qubit operations before you lose your qubit state. Okay, that's yeah, that's a good overview. And then I had like a bit more of a technical question. Maybe it, it's just like out of curiosity. How how do your T one times uh, uh, depend on on thermal noise? Like if you if you crank up the temperature or lower it a bit, have you played with these sort of things? Or? Um, it's not something I've personally played with, but certainly when you uh, one thing that um, that you can see is that if you crank up the temperature, the line shape of, so if you remember uh, in my magnetic spectroscopy, I took this intersection of the ICT and that line shape will be determined either by uh, kind of the transition rate of the electron or of the temperature. So mm -hmm. at a certain temperature, uh, your, your, uh, your or temperature basically becomes the dominant factor um, and I think typically that's around, for us, it's happened around 1.5 Kelvin. I can't say exactly how this would affect relaxation uh, um, of, of the spin states, um, but I would imagine that there would be an effect. Okay. Um, yeah. So unfortunately not a very, very clear answer. Uh, no, no, it's not something we've studied. That's um, okay, yeah. I guess um, people talk about it more when they talk about T2 maybe, but yeah. No. Um, Okay, I, we, we have a, a bunch of people who would like to ask questions. I think that Kerry sure. yep. Ferris is, is first in the queue. Yep. Yeah. Hi, Phil. Hi, Jerry. Uh, good talk, by the way. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, yeah, I mean, the question I wanted to ask you uh, was, um, did you measure the um, T1 for a singular triplet state? And just to see what the, how the numbers compare, because- Yeah. Of course, if you compare it with Australian, uh, yeah. then the T1 seems to be a bit small. But yeah. there with what we had recently and other groups, 
I still think that um, a few four microsecond is still quite large. Um, it's so a, it's a, it's a very good point um, because it could indeed be that in our system uh, the singlet to triplet relaxation time would not be significantly longer. And I really wish that we could have measured it, but uh, the reason that we couldn't was because the the triplet uh, the singlet triplet splitting was so small that it was very very hard to discern. Uh, the the difference between the singlet and triplet states, in addition to the fact that at the point where you had singlet triplet blockade, the quintet was already so low energy that basically your triplet states never become occupied. And I think I can actually just share my sl slides again because I have okay. I have an additional slide that helps illustrate this uh, quite nicely. Um, uh, here we go. So at 1.8 Tesla, mm -hmm. um, sorry, no, at 1.1 Tesla, you see that um, the, the singlet states are no longer the ground state and are have been blockaded by the triplet state. But even so, the quintet state, because there's that difference uh, in the Siemens splitting, the quintet state is already so low energy that it's very hard for us to probe the singlet uh, triplet difference. Um, so that's something that uh, uh, that well, I, with David, tried to, to probe, but... Um, could, you, um, could you use eventually a back gate, try to offset things a bit, maybe? Yeah, so that, um, I guess the back gates tend to, to change everything a bit globally. They can change yes. the, they can well, also push... Off, maybe you can... Uh... <laughs> yeah, you can change it a little bit. So um, we haven't, we didn't have the back gate connected for, for this device, but it's certainly something, it's an additional de degree of freedom that can sometimes create some asymmetries that can allow you uh, for, for some tunability. I think if I was to try to uh, measure the singlet to triplet uh, relaxation time, the best way would be to move to another electron occupancy where the quintset state is not so low energy, uh, because ultimately the quintset state uh, kind of uh, energy gap between the singlet and the quintet relies on how many, like how close are your excited states to your ground state. So if you have a, a larger splitting between your, your ground state and your excited state, it becomes easier to probe uh, uh, the differences. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, definitively, I mean, uh, if there is something there, then uh, yeah, that should be uh, pursued. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thierry. Okay, thanks, Thierry. Uh, I think the next question is from Mercedes. Hi. Um, thank you for allowing me to um, ask my question. And um, thank you for the nice talk. It was very lovely. Um, oh, yeah, the camera. Sorry. Just... <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, hello. Hello. Good to meet you. Yeah. Sorry, the, I have to adjust my camera. Okay, can you see me? We see you, yeah, at least uh, awesome. part of your head, not your whole oh. head. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> so if you... Sorry, yeah, I'm still working out how to angle it correctly. That's okay. Yeah, so um, I'm still learning this, so sorry if yep. I have any questions that um, you might think is trivial. Um, so yeah, just I have one question just that has like um, two parts to it. Yep. So um, why are you using the capacitance to measure the spins instead of electron spin residence? So um, maybe let me go back to uh, some slides. I can start answering your question in the meantime. Um, so basically uh, the electron spin resonance is typically something you use to drive rotations because it, inter it, in it allows you to connect your spin to an external drive. So then you drive, if you drive your, if you have an external drive, then that will interact with your spin and then rotate it. I think also uh, maybe an even simpler answer is that um, when you connect a, a resonator um, to uh, a qubit, then the way that you can use a resonator to read the state of that qubit is to, to see how that 
uh, resonance frequency changes. And the resonance frequency of a resonator is given by one over the square root of, uh, of the inductance uh, times the capacitance of the resonator. So here we have the inductor L um, and the capacitance is then a combination of the device capacitance, the parasitic capacitance and the coupling capacitance. So the reason that we use uh, capacitance to measure the state is because the capacitance is what changes the resonance frequency of the resonator and hence what we can actually detect using our uh, use Yeah, our but you couldn't do that with electron spin resonance? Um, not with not with a resonator uh, in this way. Uh, no, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I don't believe I mean, it's not something that I've ever seen done. Uh, so I, I would assume the answer is no. I, I know that uh, electron spin resonance is only uh, used at least in this field to to drive spin rotation. Um, okay, jolly good. Yeah, yeah. So, then, so it's not like, oh, one has an advantage over other. It's like one is measuring in a different way. Yeah, so, so I guess it's important to also distinguish between measuring, uh, so basically uh, acquiring the, the state of the qubit versus interacting or interfering with the state. So what you're trying to do yeah. with ESR is trying to change the state of the spin, which you don't really want to do if you're trying to read. Yeah, with the Zeeman splitting. Yeah, sorry, that's why I just I was like a little bit because you also mentioned the Zeeman splitting. And yeah. also, um, yeah, by organic photovoltaics, did you mean like silicon being organic or like why why is um, like is it important that it's organic or is are you just stating that so uh, there's a there's a field of organic photovoltaics which uses organic compounds as the uh, to absorb light so not this is not silicon and as a yeah. part of and i guess the reason that this field is interesting is uh, well uh, creating um, organic photovoltaics can, for example, be flexible, um, and and that's uh, kind of a broad, big uh, research area. And one of mm -hmm. the big questions in that research area is understanding the the pathway of uh, what what happens basically when a photon is absorbed in this organic photovoltaic material. Then you get this excited state um, mm -hmm. that then somehow decays, and understanding that decay pathway. Um, uh, um, is quite important. And right now, uh, or at least the most recent understanding is that it goes through this intermediate state, which has a quintet nature. Um, Jolly good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So essentially the organic is this, the, um, is, is like the type of field, but it's not like the reason I was asking because um, organic um, could be important in like biological systems, but that's not what you're, you, you're doing it for another reason. It's not like, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And then when you're talking about the pulsing, why is it that the triplet state has a um, pulse signal is irregardless? Like how come the pulse signal, like first, like you mentioned pulsing, but what are you pulsing and why is it that the triplet state doesn't have a pulse? Yeah. Um, so let me go to this slide here. So, and the end um, of that question is, how are you increasing the magnetic field? That's my end question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, let me answer the, the last one first. Uh, how do we increase the magnetic magnetic field? So basically, in in our lab, we have this dilution refrigerator that cre uh, creates this very cold temperature that we need to operate or to measure the quantum dots in. So all the measurements are done at, at low temperature and at the bottom of that uh, dilution refrigerator, there's an electromagnet. So then we can apply a very strong current to that electromagnet that creates an, an elect or a magnetic field uh, down there. And then by changing the current that we deliver to the electromagnet, it changes the magnitude of the electric or magnetic field that's applied to the device. So basically, if you can imagine uh, the electromagnet uh, kind of surrounding the device. So we have basically a, a magnet that has three axis control and then the device just sits in the middle and then depending on how much current we apply it changes the magnetic field. Ah, jolly good. Okay, cool. Yeah, and the pulsing. And then for your last question, um, I think the most important thing to remember is that whichever state has curvature uh, generates a signal. So that means that if uh, the singlet state, the blue state, is the ground state and there's a curvature, that generates a signal. If the triplet state was to be the ground state and the curving part of that ground state, um, uh, sorry, if, if that curving part is the ground state, 
then that would generate a signal. And that's simply because uh, you generate or there's a capacitance associated with the curvature and the capacitance is what uh, affects the resonator and hence what, what generates a signal. So the way we basically sense is that we can sense changes in capacitance and change, changes in capacitance only occur when there's curvature. So when we do the pulsing, we do it in an area where the triplet state has no curvature. It's completely straight. Um, so here, we, uh, the pulsing is done by delivering uh, uh, a voltage that basically um, changes the position along the y-axis here. So we start in point i here, and then as time progresses, we pulse very quickly into point m. And if we uh, compare that to, um, to this plot here, we start at uh, a little bit above zero, uh, detuning here at zero millivolts, milli electron volts. And then we pulse in very quickly into the middle here, where uh, we know that uh, the quintet state has a curvature. So we know that, OK, that curvature should generate a signal. But if the electron relaxes from the curving, uh, the, the, cur the, the quintet state, which has curvature, into the triplet state, which at that specific detuning, doesn't have a curvature, you see a difference between uh, basically having a signal and having no signal. Um, I don't know if, if that makes sense. So the pulsing just allows us, um, the pulsing allows us to access an excited state because otherwise, if we didn't pulse, we would always just be in the lowest energy state and the lowest energy state uh, uh, here is the triplet which doesn't curve and to the right of the uh, of the crossing uh, the quintet state doesn't curve for those values of the tuning so in order to be able to excite the the curving part of the quintet here we need to apply a pulse um, that goes very fast into that point because if we went slow it would just go adiabatically along the lowest energy thank you very much no problem I think we have time for one last question by, by Alex Lasek. Uh, are you on the panel, Alex? Uh, I'm here. <clears throat> Hi, Vio. Hi, Alex. Uh, I wanted to ask, <clears throat> are you capable or have you, have you tried in your system to do coherent state manipulation, like applying X, Y, Z rotations in the blocks here rather than just exciting to... Yeah, this is this is like the million dollar question for my PhD, uh, and what I what I've really been been trying to do, uh, and and hoping to do. So, um, the way that we in our system uh, can do manipulation. So, if you remember, this is our device. Very simple, just two gates. There's no like uh, no microwave line that uh, or that allows us to deliver an AC magnetic field. So, like electron spin resonance is out of the picture for doing coherent control. Um, then the other option is to use electron dipole spin resonance, but that relies on a strong spin orbit coupling. And this was kind of the hope for, for a part of this work was that uh, the um, spin orbit coupling in corner dots have been shown, like there's both some theory and some experiment that shows that the spin orbit coupling is larger in corner dots rather than uh, planar dots. Uh, so planar dots are the ones that I showed in the very beginning, mm -hmm. defined like this. Um, so in corner dots, we hope that that increased spin orbit coupling would allow us to deliver, uh, if we delivered a very fast AC uh, electric field, that, that AC electric field could couple to the spin of your electron and then drive two axis control coherently. Uh, that proved not to be the case. Uh, uh, whether exactly that's due to a lack in, in spin orbit coupling. Uh, we think that's the case, but we can't say for sure. So that means that uh, in order to achieve uh, um, coherent control, the only actually last pathway we have is to use the exchange interaction, where if you imagine that you bring these two uh, electrons slightly closer, uh, the exchange and attraction can cause them to, to start rotating. And then when they have rotated a certain amount, you can separate them again and then read. 
Um, mm -hmm. So that's uh, actually the, the last project I'm hoping to complete in my PhD is to try to show uh, uh, coherent control uh, using the exchange interaction in this platform. It has been done in other platforms, so it's not impossible. Um, it's just, uh, it would be new for, uh, for this type of uh, uh, MOS uh, CMOS platform. But very, very relevant question. <laughs> yeah, I see, thanks. Just as a follow-up to that question, how quickly do you think these operations, like what's the time scale that you think you could do these operations? So the exchange contraction is actually quite strong. So you can drive uh, quite fast rotations. Uh, the uh, actually going down to uh, below one microsecond. So like 10 to 100 of nanosecond uh, uh, implementation of uh, single qubit gates or two qubit gates. And then your electronics can keep up with that kind of... Uh... Yeah, so that then depends on, so we've designed, uh, it de depends on how you design your, your circuit. So uh, that's why the bias T's uh, come into effect and you have to think about what is your, like what's the filtering along your lines, how fast can you pulse before your pulses start getting weird shapes. And right. we know that we can do uh, gigahertz comfortably uh, along our fast lines. Um, so that gives if us your operations are on the tens of nanoseconds, then your fine gigahertz is is fine. Yeah. Yeah. But then with exchange interaction, like you could go down to really really small time scales. But I guess you're here. You're limited by your electronics rather than the exchange interaction, right? Yeah, but it also comes down to how strong can we make the exchange interaction because in uh, it, in our device, we don't have a gate that sits between the quantum dots and can directly control uh, that can directly control this barrier, mm -hmm. which is exactly the one that controls the exchange interaction, right? So if we had that gate between the two, we would have so much more control and be able to indeed like increase the exchange interaction quite freely. But for us, what we have to do is to uh, increase or decrease the uh, the gates that define the quantum dots simultaneously, but we can only do that to a certain extent before we lose our electron. So if you think about the the charge stability diagram, you can only move within like that one area that has the same charge occupancy before you go to another charge occupancy, and then your exchange coupling or exchange interaction goes down again. Is there a plan to ever have a tunneling gate? I. I, um, so I, I would like to think so because it would make things so much easier. Uh, the kind of con of having that is that then you have more connections and one more gate, yeah. Yeah, um, but for this project, the Mosquito project, which is actually now complete, that's not going to happen. But there's now a new project that's happening with the same partners, pretty much, and more. Um, was it what it, was their fancy name? Uh, QLSI, which is less fancy. But yeah, they. I, I think they might be uh, be having some of those uh, gates. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, Theodore, again, thanks uh, so much for for giving this great talk. Pleasure. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hope to see you around the Cavendish soon. Hopefully, the vaccine is coming, and and we can all go back to normal. That would be great. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so for everyone else who's been attending the, the seminar, I think we've concluded that this is going to be the last seminar of this term. We'll see you all again in the new year. And for the group members that are still on the, on the call and, and, and are waiting to, to, um, to join our group meeting, please just stay and